الله وبركاته It's good to be here in Islamabad Beautiful place An excellent country With great people And today we're going to be speaking Shortly Because we want to interact with you About the issue of atheism The issue of atheism And I've interacted with many atheists in my day And I have read effectively all their major works And I want to put to you Just one argument for God's existence Just one It is a simple argument for God's existence And actually it's not even an argument It's more of a question Okay You see You want more? Okay Oh, excellent Easy? It's very easy Very easy It's excellent, thank you yeah. You see The universe that we live in It is regular It is stable And it is uniform Is that better? <laughs> It is regular, <laughs> it is stable and it is uniform. It is regular and stable and uniform to the extent to which it allows life to exist within it. Now this is an incontrovertible fact. No one can say this is not the case. Even the most staunch atheist cannot say the universe is not there. Number one, and the universe does not exhibit uniformity, regularity, and stability. When we look at the universe, we see the harmony, the complexity of moving parts from the smallest atom to the largest celestial spheres. Now the question is, what is the best explanation for that? Is it intelligence? Or is it lack of intelligence? Now, effectively the argument ends there Because it's not really an argument, it's a question This is how easy it is The question is What best explains The uniformity, the regularity and the stability of the universe? Is it intelligence or is it lack of intelligence? Now, if someone says this lack of intelligence, together, because frankly, this is, in my view, an unreasonable position to take. And people in the past, people like William Paley, he made the very famous watchmaker's analogy. He said that if you see a watch, you see, you see a watch, and you see a rock. The rock does not have any intrinsic design, whereas the watch does have the intrinsic design. The rock is not designed, but the watch you would infer is. So many arguments have been made from this, if you like, design argument. The point I'm making is, it is a natural inference to suggest that it has come about from intelligence Now What are the arguments against this? Because someone will say Okay, that's the theistic position But what's the argument against this? So Richard Dawkins wrote a book Called The Blind Watchmaker Because it's not just anyone Making a watch It's a blind man making a watch But if it's a watchmaker He's still, by the way Someone with agency Just to let you know I And mean, he could feel it Maybe he can smell it He can lick it He could do some few things with it the fact that he's called it a watchmaker in the first place indicates that he's going to agency. But putting that to the side, he says, look, he said, before in the past, we used to think that it was God that used to do all of these things. And now, actually, we have Darwinian evolution. 
That's what we have. We have Darwinian evolution. And that is the mechanism by which and through which we understand the complexity of life. No problem. Say for the sake of argument, Darwinian evolution, no problem. It sounds like a fantastic theory. Excellent, great evidence. No problem. We'll take it on board. But John Lennox said to him in his debate with him, he said there's a difference between mechanism and agency. Just because you are able to show that things develop in a certain way, it doesn't mean that you are showing what or who developed it. For example, if there is a train that goes from Karachi to Lahore or something like this, if you are telling me how the train moves and everything, you're not telling me who is driving the train. But putting that to the side even, the Quran states, لَخَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ أَكْبَرُ مِنْ خَلْقِ النَّاسِ وَلَكِنْ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ That the creation of the heavens and the earth is greater than the creation of the human beings. Because evolution, if we take it as a serious contender, only affects biological entities. It doesn't affect the stars, it doesn't affect the moon, it doesn't affect all the things we've started off by talking about. So in his book, The God Delusion, Richard Dawkins, he said, look, we need to develop a theory of evolution for physics. That's what we need to do. That's the next step we need to do. Because he has no answer to this question. We need to develop a theory of evolution for physics. He realizes the temptation, he calls it, to ascribe design to the universe. So by invoking Darwinian evolution, you are not solving any problem. The second point is to say, well, this happened from chance. This is what to say. Chance and randomness is what happened. For example, if I were to do the lottery, I don't know if in Pakistan you have the lottery, hopefully you don't have it. But it's a kind of gambling, you see, with the numbers and stuff. Maybe you have seen them. Maybe the chance of winning the lottery is 0.01%, but there is still a chance. So some of them will say, look, even though the chance is very slender, there still remains a chance. This is what they will say. I will say, no problem, but you tell me now. What does the word chance mean? What do you mean by it? They will say randomness. Something which happens without causality. Something which just spontaneously happens without explanation. It's inexplicable. This is chance. I say what you are talking about does not exist. So now I become the atheist. But the atheist of the idea of chance. I say, look, I disbelieve in chance. I don't believe in such a thing as chance. I say to the atheist, which most of them are materialists and empiricists, I say, if chance exists, please, let's go to the laboratory together. And let's get chance, and let us put it under the microscope to see what its physical properties look like. They will say it doesn't have any physical properties. They will say you cannot smell chance. You cannot taste chance. You cannot feel chance. You cannot hear chance. And I can't remember the fifth uh, <laughs> touch. I, said, I think I said that already. See it, and you cannot see chance. You cannot see. This is a... Thing. I can't see. What are you talking about? I don't believe in this chance. This is your new God, actually. You've called him chance. But as the adage goes, bil ma'ani lal mabani. Even if you want to call God chance, it's just names you're putting onto the agency which, which designed the universe. You're just using the word chance now. Mother Nature. Mother Nature is the one who done this. Chance is the one who done this. The universe. I'm speaking to the positive forces of the universe. This is what they say. I say, why do you have to say it in that manner? So you see, chance is not an explanation for the design and the complexity and the uniformity and the regularity and the stability of the universe because chance doesn't exist as an active force. 
There is no such thing as chance. I don't say the similitude of the universe coming into existence by chance is the similitude of someone getting the lottery ticket correct. I say the chance of the universe coming into existence from chance is zero because there's no such thing as chance. This is the truth. So if it's not chance, what other explanations do you have? Huh? Huh? What kind of explanations do you have? Honestly, for the uniformity, the regularity, and the stability of the universe. So they will move on to necessity. Necessity. And they will say the universe just is like that. I say, no problem. I agree. The universe just is like that. But the question is, how did it come to be like this? <laughs> they wouldn't accept this in any other feature of life. If I was having a conversation with one of them, and he said, the universe just is like that, I say, okay. And I slap one of them in their face like that. And he says, why do you do that? He says, I just slapped you in the face like that. No explanation required. Why do I need to explain? What's wrong with you? <laughs> Go for another one, my friend. Huh? You deserve it. Especially if you're a Pakistani atheist, you deserve this one. <laughs> because we all know that you're not doing it because you came to some rational discovery. We all know you came to this conclusion due to the Goro complex. <laughs> due to the fact that the Britishers were here and they put you under the royal boot. And now that they've left, you're volunteering. You want to grovel on the hands and knees to the colonial West. This is the reason why you're an atheist Pakistani. There's no other reason for you to adopt this worldview. Oh, I've read The God Delusion. The God Delusion dedicates eight pages to the arguments for God's existence, like the cosmological arguments. The rest of it is a political and moral commentary. So what made you convert to atheism, if not the white man's control and manipulation, and your need to impress him, to be like him, to copy him, to grovel to him, to be subordinate to him. I don't see this. But let's put that to the side and I'm sure we'll discuss this in the questions and answers. But necessity is not a contradictory explanation to the explanation of God. Because if you say the universe is by determinism, we say, well, what determined it? You say, nothing determined it. I say, how is it possible that nothing can determine How can nothing do anything? Nothing is like chance. It doesn't exist. It doesn't have an active force. Like the Quran states, Am min shay'in am khaliqun. Were they created from nothing? Or were they themselves the creators of them? Nothing doesn't exist. So, necessity... The fact that the universe is by there by determinism and necessity, it doesn't contradict the idea of God. In fact, we would ask the question, what determined it? They would say, an uninterrupted causal chain. This is what they will say. We will say, where does it end? They will say, it goes on forever. I say, how? And then we can have a discussion about infinite regress, all they like. But the point I am making is, necessity does not contradict the necessary being. In fact, it's a necessary concomitant of the necessary being. So number one, we said if they say it is chance, we say, can you prove chance exists? Number two, if they say it is necessity, we will say, what determined the universe to be the way it is? If they say nothing determined it, we will say this is a problem to think this. If they say something, but then it goes back into an infinite regress. We would ask them to explain how this is logically possible. So they are stuck. They are stuck. There are no explanations which better fit the uniformity and the necessity and the regularity of the universe better than 
the intelligent designer explanation. This was understood by almost all the philosophers before this wretched new atheist movement, which now is almost finished anyway. They are finished. <laughs> they are. So once you take them through these options, you will be able to suss out if they are sincere or they are not sincere. If after this discussion they say, they say to you, I am not convinced, I say, I don't care, to be honest with you. Because nowadays, secularists and liberals and atheists in Pakistan and in the Muslim world, especially in the elite classes, they can make you feel as if they're the arbiter, and they are the judge, and you are the defendant. As the religious person, you must prove yourself. And this is the bigger issue at hand. It is a psychological issue, not an intellectual one. As if they are the Gordon Ramsay. We have a chef called Gordon Ramsay. And he sits and he eats the food and he says, very good. And the people are very happy when he says, very good. Mmm, very nice. But then when he eats the food and he throws it, spits it on the floor, then it's, it's like a nightmare for them. As a religious person, you cannot approach the liberal, atheist, secularist, feminist, whatever, that have sacrificed the Islamic values for the values of traditional Islam, as if they are a food taster, as if they are Gordon Ramsay. They're coming to you, you put the ideology there. I'm not satisfied. I'm not, excuse me, who are you? Buds are not the arbiter for what is good food and what is bad food. In fact, we should start speaking about them. Say, so can you please prove to me that liberalism, classical liberalism, which is probably what they believe, because most atheists are classical liberals, according to John Gray, I was reading his book yesterday, The Seven Types of Atheism. Many people say the same thing. Say, prove to me that classical atheism is true. Prove to me that second wave feminism that you believe in is true, for example. The proposition that despite the anatomical and biological and psychological differences between human being and men and women, that despite that there should be absolute equality in all spheres. That's a philosophical position. What's the proof that you have for it? And they will come and they'll stutter and they'll do this and they'll do that and they'll stammer. And once they're doing that, you say, why are you stuttering? <laughs> it's like an unholy, unholy way to think about it. So the point is, our religion is a religion of evidence. The Quran says, bring your evidences if you're truthful. But a real discussion and debate, whether it be in society or any other society, must start with the assumption that I must bring the evidence and you must bring the evidence and we must criticize each other's evidence. But this unequal assumption of liberal neutrality, that the liberal is already neutral and the feminist is already, and we have to now appease this, this is where we fall short. And this is where we fail in the discussions. And this is the reason why people reject religion. They say, what about inheritance laws? And what about this? And a well, man can marry four wives. So what's the problem with all of that? <laughs> what's the problem with the marriage of uh, four wives? You know, what's the, what's the issue? I had the doubt as well. I said, why is it not five or six? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this is a different story. <laughs> What I'm saying to you is, the assumption is that there should be absolute equality in all cases. Now, if you say, oh, it's because of this, and oh, it's only if this, and if the woman gets ill and sick, and she can't have a baby, and all of that. Then you're playing to their tune. You're on the back foot. You're defensive. This is the truth. We have to question the assumptions of those people. Because atheists themselves don't have a world view. And this is the second point. Atheists do not have a world view. They're, you can be an atheist Nazi. This is impossible. You can be an atheist Zionist, as I'm sure we've seen many of them. 
like Netanyahu and others. You can be this and that. You can, you can be an atheist socialist. You can be an atheist liberal. Now, the most common trend in the West is atheist liberal or agnostic liberal, for example, irreligious liberal. Just because the West is following this, it doesn't mean the rest should do that. Because white does not mean right. And West does not mean best. With that, I will conclude and ask questions and answers, inshallah. Uh, should we get the, and we want the sisters to get involved as well. We, don't want, we want to keep, restore some balance here. So let's get the, um, the microphone to the sisters. We'll have one question from the brothers, one question from the sisters, and we'll keep alternating uh, for some time. Okay. Um, the brothers. There's one brother here, the good-looking brother in the front here. MashaAllah, yes. Give him the microphone, please. Yes, good-looking brother. Give him the microphone here. No, I said the good-looking brother, please, yeah? No, I'm just... <laughs> yes. So, uh, you, uh, we do have a panel discussion, the question Q&A will also be done. We will have like 10 to 15 minutes for you talk. Okay. Then after that, we'll yeah, we'll do, yeah, so we're going to have another Q&A with the panel discussion, but this is just like 10, 15 minute Q&A. We'll have like two questions from each side, something like that, and then we'll do another one afterwards. Is that okay? Yes. Please. Hello. Salam. This is a good-looking brother. Yes. Are you trying to tell the sisters something there? <laughs> huh? And when you said this, are you, were you pointing this way to be? <laughs> go ahead, please. Not, not as good looking as you. Oh, well, that's of course the truth, but go ahead. <laughs> that's the objective truth. <laughs> that no atheist can deny. Go ahead. <laughs> please. What is the solution to the Gora complex? The solution to the Goro complex, number one, like any other solution of any other psychological impediment or pathology that someone may have, is number one, the acknowledgement of it. So someone must acknowledge, okay, I have the Goro complex. I, yani, just like, you know, in the AA meetings for the drunkards and the intoxic <laughs> intoxicated people. No, the first thing they teach you is, okay, let's all admit we have a problem. Now, obviously, not all aspects of... All Portions. I would say the vast majority of Muslims in Pakistan they don't have that. Alhamdulillah. If you go to the village, they don't care about this and that and the other. Maybe to some extent, but it's nothing major. But for those elites at the top in the secular world of Pakistani you know, society, if they really feel honest with themselves about this, the first thing they have to say is, look, we have a problem. We, can, we believe this and that. And, and what we believe is irrational. And that's stage number two. To realize that your belief is irrational. Your belief is irrational. The reason why it's irrational is because it doesn't follow that the more money you have, the more right you are. I know that sounds like a very basic thing to say, but it's the truth. Just because in the streets you have clean streets and tall buildings. And by the way, you have clean streets and tall buildings here in Islamabad. MashaAllah, especially compared to the other parts of Pakistan and a large part of the Muslim world. But just because the West have clean streets and tall buildings, it doesn't mean that their ideologies are correct. So once you realize these two things, okay, then you start training yourself to realize, okay, I'm falling into the trap here. And so it's a two-stage process, effectively, but it requires training for you to think, okay, well, look, let's look at the history of Islam, for example. For 95% of Islamic history, the Muslim empires have been either the superpower or one of the superpowers. So if the proposition was true, which is not anyway, that more money means more, more truth, then for the majority of our history, we've had more truth. <laughs> and they've been on the falsehood. It doesn't even make sense like this. But I'm just saying. And it turns out that we had more prosperity going for us anyway when we were closer to the religion, ironically. And the second point to ask this Pakistani seculars is what contribution have you made? Because the thing is, a lot of the attack is, okay, well, we need to be more advanced and progressive, okay? And we need to stop being like the West because they look at them in science and technology, and it's true. The sci you know, in science and technology, the West is doing very well for itself due to myriad factors, including colonialism and other things, taking the spices of the 
Indians and the Pakistanis and, and putting it in Manchester and stuff like this. But let's put that to the side, no problem. Now there is reverse colonialism. MashaAllah, the Manchester is filled with the Pakistanis there. So <laughs> taking the spices back. <laughs> but, but the point I'm making is this. Is, the point I'm making is that if it is the case for 95% for of our history, we have been, when we were closer to religion, we actually had good prosperity going for us. But I'm not saying, therefore, that's the cause for it. And Allah says in the Quran, that These are the days which we alternate between the people. Sometimes you'll have material success and sometimes you'll not have material success. It's not an evidence of truth. So once you instill these notions in your mind, then you can get over the Gora complex. Let's have another question from the sisters. I'm not going to make the same joke with the sisters because that would be totally inappropriate. And I can't see anyone anyway. Salam. So good to see you here in this Well, thank you very much. Um, so I have a quick question. Yes. Um, just like you're talking about God's delusion. Yeah. Um, what if somebody born in a Christian family or in a atheist family and to die like that? Uh, because actually some atheists asked me that question and I didn't have any answer, unfortunately. So I really need an explanatory answer. So what if they die like that? And what is their fault in it? Because what he said that Allah made them born in a Christian. Why are you speaking to a brother, sister, huh? <laughs> what he said, I'm only kidding, keep going. Yeah, because I was actually in a wedding and I was no, no, I'm only joking. Sure, sure, sure. I, I'm, it must be a <laughs> I'm only kidding with you, go on. Yeah. And if we Muslims are naturally born in a Muslim family, so yeah. it's not something to be, uh, it's not something very big and to yeah. be based about. Mm -hmm. So, um, and what do they die like that? What do they sure. have to do exactly to find the right religion? Because if, even if you are Muslims, we don't really know uh, many religions that are that are existing in this world. So what yeah. if they don't know the religion of Islam? What if, do they do if they don't know the religion of Islam and they die as atheists or polytheists, then we cannot say that they're going to hell. Because of the verse in the Quran where it says, وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبَعَثَ رَسُولًا We were not going to punish people until we send them a messenger. So the scholars of Islam, almost by consensus, they said that you will not be punished. Even if you die as a Hindu, okay, if you die as like, you know, you believe in Ghanish is your god or one of those gods, you believe that, <laughs> but, but you've never actually had the message of Islam that you, we cannot say you will go to hell. We will say that the majority of scholars state that there will be an independent test for you on the day of judgment. That Allah will do imtihan, khas. Imtihan is also an Urdu word, right? Yes. It's khas also in it. Oh, beautiful. So you all are imtihan khas. Okay, there will be a very special test for you as, a, you know, a, a Hindu or a whatever, you're atheist or something. However, if you did hear the message of Islam in its purity and uncorrupted form and you rejected it, this is where we are talking about the disbelievers that will go to hell and etc. So to answer him, we say, no, we don't believe that all non-Muslims will go to hellfire. That's not what we believe. We believe that disbelievers will go to the hellfire. And the disbelievers are the ones who have been subjected to the evidences, exposed to them, and then they have rejected those evidences after that. And, and there's difference of opinion among the scholars. To what extent must they be exposed to the evidence? And that ranges as another conversation. Do they have to be exposed to the evidences? Do they must see the... Or was it just to hear the Quran, for example? There's all kinds of uh, opinions there. And... The, the, the bottom line is, we wouldn't say all non-Muslims that die upon uh, non-Muslim beliefs would go to the hellfire. Let's have one more from the brothers and then one final from the sisters. And I'll come back and we will do a, Q, a panel Q&A afterwards. Realism. Or some aspects of second wave feminism. You may think that's common sense. You may think that's common. it makes sense to believe that there should be absolute equality in all cases and this and domestic and all that. You, you may think this is absolutely... Fine, it's no problem. The evidence against the fact that this is the case is that 200 years ago, and we have 
a legend, mashallah. Yes, I will attend to you in my own time. This is a man who Pakistan is very honored to have as one of his own. We are talking about a man who has, mashallah, debated the big, the big figures of atheism and Christianity and Shiism and recently Qadianism. <laughs> where he has annihilated and des completely decimated the opponents in a manner which uh, is comical, entertaining and informative. We are talking about none other than Adnan Rashid. Please give him a round of applause. He is undoubtedly a mentor of mine and someone we all look up to in the Dawah, someone who is a pillar of Pakistani society and also of British society and a crossroads between the two, a man that everyone should be proud of. And I think he's from Islamabad himself or somewhere like this. So is he not? I don't know. But <laughs> if he's not, it would be a great shame for Islamabad because this man is doing some absolutely excellent work. But going back to the point about fitra, the fitra, you don't know for a fact whether something is the case of your fitra is telling you this is right and wrong morality, or it's because society. Ibn Taymiyyah mentioned that, for example, in Dara Ta'ar bin Aqlul Naq. Himself, he had lots of work about the fitra, but he said, you don't know for a fact, you cannot tell you what is right and wrong about these issues. So you need a list from God, as John Mackey said, the atheist. He's right. You need, especially now, where we have transhumanism, forget about transgenderism. We are talking about transhumanism where there's like a Robocop individual human being, Terminator, and he's human, he's real. And they are talking about giving robots rights and things like that. We, need, we are at the most important time in history where we need to be told this is right and this is wrong according to the higher authority. Let's have the last question from the sisters and then we'll come back inshallah and we will have a question and answer session again. Uh, Salam. Every God or God to believe in. So everyone has their own evidences of their own God, right? So I wanted to have, like, I wanted to know what makes our religion like a religion like the the religion. Because I've asked this question uh, to multiple people, and they have all just said, "Oh, this miracle, that miracle," but I've never had a, an answer that would actually satisfy the question. So if you could please. Uh, uh, that is fine. I understand your point. But if we were talking about complex mathematics, or scientific theorem, or historical fact, many people might have many interpretations of one specific fact. It doesn't mean all of them are the same. For example, there's a man called John JFK who was shot. There are many competing explanations as who killed him, who shot him. Or Malcolm X, many competing explanations, who shot him, who killed him. It doesn't mean because there are many explanations, all of them have their evidences and we must... No, one of them is true and the rest of them are false. And religion has the same parameters and we should deal with it in the same way. I will say to you that in logic, in propositional logic, L1 logic, there is a concept referred to as the necessary and the sufficient conditions. Let me tell you what this means. For example, if I wanted to get the good-looking man here married, because I have a mission, say for example, I want to get him married today. Is my, are you married already? Yes, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Someone of his looks and his... Absolutely, you should be married to at least three women. Two is not enough. Two is not enough. But say I want to get him married. So I say to him, oh, fine. What are the necessary conditions? So there must be a man and there must be a woman. Now some people from the LGBT will say, already we've, you've lost us. <laughs> I will say, we never had you in the first place. <laughs> this is something else. 
But if I got this good looking man here today in this green chair, and one of the sisters came, and I said, okay, I now pronounce you husband and wife, it wouldn't work because there's not the sufficient conditions, you see. So the necessary conditions for a marriage to take place in Islam is that you must have a man and you must have a woman. But it's not the, it's not the sufficient conditions. Because you need two witnesses. And then you need the uh, mahar. And in Pakistani culture, you need so many more things as well. Rukhsati <laughs> and this one and that one. I say, I don't believe in this culture. Anyway, it's not the sufficient conditions required for marriage. So, religion works in a similar way, and everything else works in a similar way, right? There are things which religion must have to be true, and things that they need to have to be sufficiently true. Let me give you an example. So, necessary conditions of religion is that a religion cannot have contradictions. Cannot have contradictions, because if it has contradictions, then it's not from God. When we open the Bible, the very first page of the Bible, it tells us that the heavens and the earth were created. And the first day, God created the night and the day. And the fourth day, He created the sun and the luminaries. But how can you have night and day without the sun? And on the third day, you had the veget vegetation and the plantation. But how can you have the plantation without the sun? But then when you go to chapter 2, verse 5, which is the next page exactly, it tells you no, pro no plant had sprung up yet. But I thought it said already that the plant had sprung up in, in day 3. So there is like five contradictions in two pages, and they happen to be the first two pages of the Bible. Which means that this religion of Christianity, and by the way, Judaism as well, is disqualified at the first hurdle. Because the books contain within them contradictions. Islam of these religions, of these ancient religions, are the f only religion, is the only religion, which even offers a test of falsifiability. It says if this was from other than God, there would have been many contradictions in it. There would have been many contradictions inside of it. So these are necessary conditions. A necessary condition is like, we, for example, you mentioned people believe in many gods. But the idea that there are many gods is itself a contradiction, for example. Because you can have two all-powerful beings. But if there's two all-powerful beings, how is this possible? For example, if all-powerful being, one, wanted this microphone to go this way, and all-powerful being, two, wanted the microphone to go this way, if it goes this way, then all-powerful being, two, is not the true god. If it goes this way, then all-powerful, a, is not the true god. If it stays the same, both of them are not the true God. This is called Dalil at tamana Very well known thing. So polytheism is a contradictory the theological explanation. So when you have contradiction, which even in mathematics they have proof by contradiction, you are able to cut out all of the false religions. And already just by doing this exercise you will be surprised as your results. Because almost all, if not all, of the religions can be cut out like that. But then what about the sufficient conditions? Because we said there are necessary conditions. Necessary condition one is, for example, there cannot be contradictions. Necessary condition two is that the books must be preserved. Because if it's a book from God, I have to have access to the same guidance as the initial audience had. But we already know and Adnan Rashid will tell you even in greater detail of the corruption of the other scriptures. He, he knows about this. He's debated people about this. He's shown all the evidence, the manuscripts and all this kind of things. So you have one of your own. He's one of the great ones. He'll tell you. So this is the necessary conditions. Number two, the sufficient conditions. The sufficient conditions now, I'll give you one, and there are many things I can tell you. And if you want more information, go to my website, muhammadhajab.com. And I have a small PDF free of charge. And it's the proofs why Islam is the truth. Yes? But I will just give you one example. And I give this example many times. It's the example of the Romans and the Persians. The Quran says, غُلِبَتُ الرُّومِ فِي أَدْنَ الْأَرْضِ وَهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ غَلَبِهِمْ سَيَغْلِبُونَ the Romans had been defeated 
in a nearby lowland, but afterwards they would defeat the Persians. That to Allah belongs the situation from the beginning and to the end. But look how Allah says, it says, Wa'd Allah, la yukhlifullah wa'dahu. This is certainly the promise of God. Let me tell you something. If I Pakistan was going to beat India in the cricket match, in the semi-finals of the World Cup of the cricket, and they will beat them with this score, and it will be Baba Azim, <laughs> who, who, who is the deciding man in the situation. Yes? And I am getting all of this information from God. And God does not go against His word. And this is the promise of God. If I said this. Now if I say and now everybody is waiting to see, and then Pakistan gets humiliated, and Baba Azim has an injury, then my credibility is gone as somebody who claims to be speaking about the future. Now, this happened in many of the religions. For example, Qadianism. <laughs> He's been dealing with them. This guy called Ghulam Ahmed, which in Arabic means boy. Boy Ahmed. The boy said, I will get married to a woman called Muhammadi Begum. This is what he said. He said, if I don't get married to her, I'm not a true prophet. This is what he said. Can you imagine? He was so over her. <laughs> he loved her so much. He, he actually had the audacity to say this. It's like if this good looking man here, he becomes overconfident and he says, you know what? Any woman here, get married, no problem. Because I've got the, <laughs> got the confidence from Muhammad Hajab. And then he goes and then all of them reject him. <laughs> Ghulam Ahmad he did not get married to Muhammadi Begum. This itself is enough of a proof that he's a false prophet. He's not a true prophet. This itself, khalas, I don't want to hear the rest. I don't know how he died on the toilets or what he was doing on the toilet. Maybe he was defecating or masturbating or whatever he was doing. So to say, I don't care how he died. <laughs> and they say this is a sign he's not, it doesn't matter. Ghulam Ahmad is not a true prophet. Likewise, the Bible itself has something called the Olivet Discourse, which is mentioned that in one generation, everything will be finished. There will be the Day of Judgment will happen. C.S. Lewis, he said about this, he's one of the great scholars, he said this is the most embarrassing verse in the Bible. Because it didn't happen, the opposite happened. So when you have a prophecy and it goes wrong, this falsifies your claim to prophethood. There is no prophecy in Islam which goes wrong. And this prophecy about the Romans beating the Persians is time specific. It says in three to nine years. And it happened in eight years and by the evidence of even primary source historical information by non-Muslim sources. And there is a book called The Forbidden Prophecies by Abu Zakaria which goes into more detail about that. But the point I am making is just this idea of prophecies. Because no one knows the future. Is itself a proof that Islam is the truth? So just to summarize, you have necessary and, con and sufficient conditions. What are some of the necessary conditions? Number one, that there cannot be any huh? contradictions. And that the book must be preserved. And that disqualifies majority of the religions. If you want some sufficient conditions now, we have what? That there are prophecies. And we've just given one example of prophecies and the other religions which have false prophecies which show that it's not the true religion. With that we will conclude and we'll come back for questions and answers. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. That Pakistan is the strongest Muslim country in the world. And if Pakistan changes, the entire Muslim world can change. Which requires a cultural revolution. Just as it requires I'm not going to say anything else, actually. <laughs> but it requires the cultural revolution. I think that's more important than anything else. So, because of this, I've come to Pakistan. And I want to be able to influence the elites. When we talk about elites here, we're talking about people who...
to influence Pakistani society, therefore, in the future, because we need these people to steer us in the correct political direction. I don't know about the second question, whether we're going to open up something, Sapiens Institute, here in, uh, in Pakistan. But that's not my decision. That's the decision of Hamza Zulsis, who's the CEO of the Sapiens Institute. We do have our courses, which are free of charge. We have an entire learning platform, which is free of charge, which you can go and find in sapiensinstitute.com. The org, sorry. <laughs> and you will be able to sign up, get free books, free material. Uh, also, we have the YouTube channel with more in detailed kind of in-depth courses. And the third part of the question was what again? Uh, democracy. Uh, you, you see, Pakistan has an advantage. With all of the other Muslim countries, Pakistan is one of those countries because when it was founded, as Adnan and others will be able to tell you in more detail in 1947, by Muhammad Jinnah and others, when it was founded, it, the constitution of this country actually does state that the laws must be subservient to the Qur'an and Sunnah or something like that, which you will not find in most of the countries of the Muslim world. And I'm not saying that the amalgamation of parliamentarianism and Islamic values that exist in Pakistan is the ideal amalgamation from an Islamic perspective. But what I am saying, it is better than most countries in the Muslim world, if not, I'm not going to say all of them, because there are some countries with the same kind of constitutional clauses, actually, in the Muslim world, most countries in the Muslim world. And it's a country that was effectively started on the basis that these are Muslims and they are to be divided from the Hindus. And so Islam is the, the, the defining identity in Pakistan. Without Islam, you have no Pakistan. Pakistan doesn't even make sense without Islam. And so as such, you already have an advantage. And we have seen that if you have political authority and leadership, which has more Islamic, if you like, belief systems, that the whole country will follow in that direction. Only a few things need to be changed. But in terms of using democracy as an instrument, the scholars of Islam have differed. The majority view is it can be used as an instrument but it should not be used as some kind of an objective truth. For example, if I think that I ask a group of people whether or not such and such thing is correct relating to homosexuality or otherwise, and that whatever the majority say is objectively true, then this is a kind of kufr and shirk actually. This is a kind of disbelief in Islam because you believe that the collective understanding of people is objectively true. However, if you're using democracy as a means to an end, which happens to be Islamic, the majority of scholars of Islam through all schools of thought accept this. It's okay, maybe you can do this. And so democracy is something, especially representative democracy, which can self-implode. Because theoretically, if you had the referendum and someone asked, should we have no democracy? And the democratic majority said, yes, theoretically, there should be no democracy. Because the majority of people do not want democracy. So since democracy or representative democracy has the propensity of self-implosion, it can be used, the majority would say, as an instrument or a means to a further end. And I think probably it's your best bet in Pakistan, unfortunately not with recent elections, but that's a different discussion for a different day. But in terms of, in principle, I see nothing wrong with it. And Allahu A'lam. Thinking about this one or that one. So uh, to be honest with you, uh, I don't know about all of that. And... Uh, I would say that it's probably best when it comes to Muslim people not to mention their names. Why? Because if it's Muslims, especially in the Dawah, these kinds of clips can be taken out of context and it leads to 
division within the Muslims. And right now, I think we don't want divisions within the Muslim because it's like as Muhammad Jinnah said, you know, he said Iman, he said what? Ittihad, and then he said number one is Tanzim, right? That's what we need in Pakistan now. We don't need Tafriqa and division. So this is, we have to be careful about that, my friend. When, when people say, well, for example, Japanese people are happy or Scandinavian people are happy and stuff like that, the kind of things they usually refer to is something called the happy index, which is an economic um, kind of um, aggregate economic indicator where they put together things like HDI, which is Human Development Index, GDP per capita, life expectancy, etc. And they say as a result of all these things, when you add it together, these are, this is the list of countries which are happiest. And then they'll put, like, I don't know, Norway or Denmark or something as number one and that kind of thing. This is not actually a psychological investigation. And this is, the happy index is used um, equivocatingly. It's not actually showing you who's happy and who's not. It's just showing you who's got more money and who's got less money. So the question then remains, who has, where is the evidence on who's happy and who's not happy? So there's two studies in particular that I'm going to cite and then I'm going to move um, it over to Amram because he has some more information on the matter. One of them is Pew Research Study, 2019, okay, where they looked at the difference between religious people and non-religious people in general. And they concluded, and Pew Research is considered to be the gold standard of sociological investigation. They concluded that religious people actually have more satisfaction in their lives than non-religious people. So that's the first study I'm going to cite. The second study that I'll cite is actually something specific to Muslims. And it is the only study that I've come across with this, these parameters. And funny enough, I actually did discuss the matter with Jordan Peterson, because as you know, I spoke to him. And he's a psychologist, but, but you know, he's recently come out and uh, you know, gone astray with his comments on Netanyahu. But I did discuss this matter with him, because this was a study that was published in 2020, yes? And it was a study that was done at the University of Mannheim in Germany. And you had a woman called Laura Marie and a few other you know, investigators or researchers in that study. And the name of the study is The Effect of Oneness Belief on Life Satisfaction. Literally everything you want, right? So the study is... Uh, the effect of oneness belief of life satisfaction. It's a 13-page study. You have to pay money to buy it, to buy it, but you can get the you know the, the conclusions of it pretty easily. Interestingly, this study it looked at different things, including relationships and empathy, different psychological means to test life satisfaction, and they came to the conclusion that the most satisfied people were Muslims. This is what they. This is the conclusion they came to. This is not Muslim people doing this study. This is not, uh, you know, funded in Saudi Arabia or something, or Pakistan. Or, or, you know, of course they're going to say that. This is done in Germany, okay, with non-Muslim researchers. And they said, they literally wrote the word Muslim. And their, the thesis that they brought forward is, when you have oneness beliefs, when you believe in one thing, so we as Muslims believe one God worthy of worship, it makes you focus on one thing which reduces anxiety. And this was, if, I mean, I had the discussion and it's public, you can watch it anyway with Peterson, what he actually said. He said it makes sense that Muslim people have less depression and anxiety. He said because when your focus is not multiplicitous, and he always does this for his fingers, give them hell, Netanyahu, give them hell. <laughs> Just, anyway, it, it was, it, when the focus is not multiplicitous, when it's only like one focus, which essentially we have one focus, which is to worship Allah, then you are able to have more satisfaction in your life. It, so it reduces anxiety. And so this is a very interesting study, you see. This is a very interesting study. And actually it dispels the notion that the more money you have, the more satisfied you are in life. The Quran says, أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنُّ الْقُلُوبِ that certainly with the remembrance of God, do your hearts find rest. Now, research is showing us how and why that is the case. 
Now research is showing us that the reason why that's the case is because when you focus on one thing, then you become less distracted in life, less anxious in life, and it whittles life down to a manageable portion. Because life, if you had to focus on everything, you would become very disturbed. But effectively, if everything goes back to the worship of Allah, then you don't become disturbed in that manner. And on the flip side, you have in the Quran, وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكًا وَنَحْشُرُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَعْمَى Whoever swerves away from my remembrance will have a depressed life and we will make him on the Day of Judgment blind. So as I say, there's evidence of this now. Another interesting study, which is the last one I'll mention before I pass the mic on, is one that was done at the University of Harvard. A very famous, what you call longitudinal study, which spanned over 30 or 40 years. And they wanted to know what it is that produces satisfaction for people and good quality of life and contentment. And they came to the conclusion that actually it is relationships. So for example, people that had bad relationships with their parents were more likely to have bad lives effectively. People that had bad relationships with their family members, with their they, they were more likely to, it doesn't matter what money they had, they could be very rich people, there were many rich people in that study. But if they had bad relationships, they were, were shown to be very depressed or having a less or subpar quality of life compared to the, the colleagues who did have good relationships. We would say the best relationship to have is the relationship with Allah. After that, then your relationship with your your mother and your father, your spouse is extremely important. That's why when you, if you're married and you have a bad time with your husband or wife, it can affect your entire life. As they say, happy wife, happy life. <laughs> I don't know how, why they assume happy wife. Why not happy wives, happy life? <laughs> but that is a different story for a different day. <laughs> I've been here in Pakistan for a very long time by myself. This is why I keep making the jokes about <laughs> women and <laughs> this and that. You see. But anyway, the point I'm making to you is <laughs> Allah says in the Quran, وَقَدَ رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا He puts it in that hierarchy. Number one thing, to worship Allah. And number two thing, to be good to your parents. This is how Allah puts it. If you follow the guidelines of Allah and the Messenger, you will, be, you will have a content and satisfied life. And there is a difference between having a satisfied life as compared to having a happy life. Happiness is different to satisfaction. Happiness is, I mean, the highest forms of happiness are ecstasy and euphoria. And even from a biological or physiological perspective, it's not good to always be in that state. Because usually when you're in that state, then you crash afterwards. For example, there are many drugs you can take that can make you euphoric. Hopefully no one has tried them <laughs> here in Pakistan. But if you take ecstasy or some of this, you know, mushrooms or whatever it may be, you know, then you can get ecstatic. But then the next day you get crushed. Forget about that. I mean, if many of you have ADHD, yes, you can take Ritalin or Adderall or one of these ones and it increases your dopamine by times 20, something like that, crazy thing. And it gives you a bit of ecstasy, but afterwards it crashes and you will feel worse afterwards. So happiness is not the state you always want to be in. Satisfaction and contentment is the state that you want to be in.